Technologists love architect. It's because of your systems thinking. You can really look at how you bring lots of different things together. Business of Architecture UK, episode 17. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. My name is Ryan Willard and this week I am speaking with architect entrepreneur Safia Qureshi. So this is the last in my series of my little mini series of speaking with architects who have transcended the traditional realms of architectural practice. Now Safia is quite a formidable character and she started out her business journey with an architectural practice called Studio Detail and this practice was dedicated to exploring various research ideas that she had as well as doing uh, your typical architectural services, interior designs uh, and you know renovation work and one of the ideas that came out of her research was for a returnable package service for hot and cold drinks um, to replace single-use plastics and since that idea emerged, Safia has developed this into a fully-fledged entrepreneurial venture with a mission to eliminate waste plastic, and she's called it Cup Club. Um, she has found investment for Cup Club. She's made the transition from an architect to a CEO, and she's now partnering with catering companies, facilities management businesses, retailers, brands, and she also launched a successful pilot scheme at the Royal Academy of Art, uh, a few years ago and last year she was awarded the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's New Plastics Economy Innovation Prize. So her story, it really is truly remarkable and speaking to her was, was really fascinating. She shared some incredible insights and wisdom about her entrepreneurial journey. So please enjoy this episode. I'm here with Safia Qureshi who is an entrepreneur and architect and is the co-founder of design agency Studio Detail and also the founder of Cup Club. So welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. Very good to be talking with you. So how would you describe yourself? What, what are you? What do you do? Uh, I would describe myself as an architect, designer, um, environmentalist, um, lover of crime detective TV, <laughs> <laughs> um, hater of football in the World Cup <laughs> right now, um, someone who's an advocate of removing um, useless single-use plastics from our world and making mm. it a better place generally. And so how did you go from being an architect, the co-founder of a, a more sort of traditional um, design agency, to now working in manufacturing and plastics, essentially? Uh, good question. So I guess frustration. So I started the agency with my co-founder, Maxwell. We both went to the Bartlett together. Um, we both wanted to build our own businesses and we both wanted to build our own projects or design our own projects as opposed to become very responsive but actually kind of really th deep dive and think about problems and try and see if we can solve them. Um, so the agency came about from just just that alignment to do something different, um, fall out of the typical kind of roadmap of architects or what you're sort of taught to be mm. as an architect is set up a traditional architecture studio, but actually try and uh, reimagine what that might be um, and try and do that in a way where you're not forced with any constraints. So we were very lucky. We sort of had set up the design studio with very lean uh, teams initially, more like an agency actually. So we just built the teams as we went along. Um, so yeah, born out of frustration, it was... Um, also an interesting place at the time, um, we geographically were separated. So Maxwell's in Cape Town in South Africa and then also in Harare, Zimbabwe. I was in London and um, the UK. So we came about building briefs and looking at new emerging markets, but also global markets and problems that we could solve. So you're kind of inventing your own briefs here as yeah. a, rather than kind of uh, waiting for projects to come in. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have any projects. We just started <laughs> and no one knew about us. So we thought, um, why don't we just try and figure out, you know, what, what's needed in the world. We're really, you know, we're, we're really passionate and um, let's try and see 
what the opportunities are and not hold ourselves back and have 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 fun with it like play and um genuinely believe in the fact that we can do this mm. and not let that stop us and just go for it so yeah we didn't wait necessarily for projects to land in we we applied for a lot of really interesting um opportunities as well so the typical biennales and some submitting in work and competitions which every studio practice does when it first kicks off so we did a lot a lot of that and then alongside that we had our own pet projects so cup club was mine um max's was dollar vans and we we sort of grew both of those simultaneously and we showcased it at the architecture uh, biennale in chicago mm. um and uh, also in um, venice biennale and a bunch of other places and then it kind of grew into no longer pet projects but things that we felt really had a value to society so what is cup club so cup club essentially is a returnable packaging service for drinks both hot and cold that's when i say returnable it's it's packaging that is takeaway and can be returned to a network of drop points. So it's basically designed to eliminate single-use packaging. And at the moment, that's in highest volumes, it's cups. So mm. drinks, whether it's coffee cups or it's um, takeaway beverage containers. Um, we decided about three years ago that there was a market opportunity to replace them with reusable packaging that consumers could take away from their cafes, canteens, restaurants, but also use in um, internal coffee stations and drinks vending um, and when they were finished it put into drop cases um, and what we realized was there was an opportunity to collect those drop cases return the product back to the retailer and actually turn this entire thing into a service model so it's looking at packaging currently which is a very linear process of sale where a manufacturer will make it send it to a distributor a distributor will send it to retailer a b and c um, that retailer will issue it out to consumer X, Y, and Z. Um, and that consumer will then drop it into bin EFG. <laughs> right. And then so on and so on. And this complexity keeps moving down the chain. And there is an exchange of value as you go down the chain. It keeps on reducing in value. And so what we decided to do was the impact of that is so immense um, was to actually produce the product so that it has a, a better quality from the beginning, it's more durable, that a consumer can borrow at the point of sale in the same way that they do, and when they're finished, they actually just return it to a drop point, and we collect, wash, pack, and then redistribute the whole thing. And for every cycle, every loop, um, and they're designed for 150 loops, um, we charge a service fee to our retailers. Right, so the people that have got the cups not the not the end person drinking from the cups but the person who's distributing them exactly so it, it's a b2b so the service model they would say great uh, cup club we sell a thousand coffees at uh, location a 500 at b and 600 at c can you send us volumes for all of those locations and so the cases come packed with all the cups and lids they get decanted they start serving them coffee at those locations. The customers take it away. When they're finished, they put it back into those cases, and we collect the cases at the end of the day. Right. So it gets replenished on a daily basis, and there's no waste. There's no um, waste generated not just from the packaging, but there's also no waste generated from the outer packaging because the cases are also returnable. So there's no cardboard. There's no plastic covers. So we've just completely cleaned up that entire um, packaging industry mm. and replaced it with a service model, which is completely circular. So it's, in, it's, it's, a, new, um, it's a new innovative product. Um, we've seen similar operational, operationally. These are very, very old ways of operating in terms of reverse logistics or collecting products, washing them and sending them back out and essentially using it as a loan system. We see that in catering companies. Um, and we've seen the beer bottling as well as some of the drinks bottling companies apply the same kind of technology, not technology, but operational systems. Mm. So we've overlaid all of that with tech um, and integrated 
technology into every product that we manufacture so we can track it across the supply chain and we know where the product is but also we know how many times that product has been used so in a cup like what we're drinking from right now there is a piece of technology that's helping you document various metrics about where that is how many times it's been used yeah so it's a it's basically the provenance uh, not just of the material so the plastics itself that tells us a story but also the story behind that particular product where it went um, for the first time to retailer a who it was then issued to which was consumer b um, where it was then returned, which is location C, and then how it came back to us. And that entire log then allows us to understand the dynamics as well of how people consume, which is really important and interesting. Mm. Because if you imagine cities and how they work, we've got concentration of most of global population living in cities. And we need to feed them, and we need to do it in an efficient, um, more seamless way which is less wasteful which is um, more organized and so this kind of data or level of understanding and visibility through the tech enables us to know um, how much food we need to prepare in advance to feed a population like ours whether that's coffee whether that's the next kind of product which will be for food etc cetera, etc cetera. so it enables us to create more efficiency in our operations so we know where is the product in the supply chain. Is it, it at retailers? Is it still with consumers? Is it in the washing phase? Is it um, in transit or mm. is it in the warehouse? And so how has your architectural thinking and background influenced this? Because this is quite a, a step away from designing private residences yep. and houses. And it's, it's wonderful. I mean, I, I just find it so exciting to be talking with an architect who's I can see the kind of ways of you know there's a kind of master planning element to this and thinking about the city in a different way and how it operates and its occupants and those kind of architectural conversations that we often have in academia and at university but then they kind of often will dry up when we go into practice yeah and so here's a very different way of practicing architecture agreed I think for so I think what architects are very good at is understanding scale, mm. but then also really getting down to the details. Like yes. We're really, really particular about mitered joints or the finish <laughs> on, you know, the stone. What, you know, is it satin? Is it, um, is it uh, stone blasted? Is it, you know, there's just so much complexity that we build into everything we do. But then, of course, we are also thinking about the wider, the wider view. How do we master plan? How do we create a bigger um, vision for what we want to do? And then how do we really zoom into the finer details? So our global plastics problem is a global problem. It's, it's one of the biggest problems we're currently facing. And yet the things that are in um, operation terms on that plastics problem issue is what we're carrying in our hands. And it's what we're using to eat, drink, sleep, and live. Mm. And so how do you address a global, huge scale problem, which is affecting mostly cities right now, because that's really where our consumption is the highest. Um, and how are we designing around that to reduce our impact at the granular level? Right. So you sort of have to connect both because they're not disassociated at all. Whenever you talk about um, plastics in the ocean or a certain drinks brand is um, being campaigned with by, by Greenpeace, um, you start to correlate it directly with retail where you're buying or your workplace where you're eating and drinking or your university where you're studying. Like it's very contextualized in that space mm. and then you're looking at the global picture and you're seeing um, horrific images now on tv on social media and that is a design problem it's not anything other than just simple design which we're using on an everyday basis which is not really being addressed and so from a from an architecture perspective where the architecture hat is um, it's sort of thinking at that granular scale level, uh, sorry, at that big city scale level, and then also at the granular scale level. And how do you build systems that enable those two to come together in a city, in a city kind of context? So for us, 
That's why the language that we use for this, um, this is intelligent packaging. It's, you know, integrated with technology and RFID, but we say it's returnable packaging within a system of network of drop points. And those can be anywhere. They can be in your retail space. They can be in your workplace. They can be in your education space. Those are in spaces, in buildings. Mm. Um, so that is all what we are obsessed about. It's, it's optimizing how we live and how we work and how we play. And if that has some value in how we drink and eat, then we need to fix those. So kind of, um, if you're looking at it without you know, hearing the story, it probably seems like this is very strange. But it's very relevant. I think the thinking for and the training behind what we do is to look at both micro and macro yeah. and understand how do, they, how do they come together. So from a business perspective then, so you've had the experience of running a kind of more conventional design agency where you're designing people's houses and now this kind of entrepreneurial venture how have you found the two different and are you still involved with your with your other design practice how does that how do they fit in so you have to um you evolve a lot so the, your 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 role the role of an architect is very different to the role of an entrepreneur or someone who is, uh, in my case, doing something that's completely outside my comfort zone. I've never trained in packaging and didn't know a thing about plastics. Um, certainly had no clue about operations or supply chains, other than maybe understanding you know, the construction world and programming to some degree what material needs to arrive when on a site so that we can get this part of the project completed before the next one. And there's a, some kind of supply chain or understanding of that and coordination that's required between engineers, planners, and structural engineers. Yeah, like I can handle the logistics. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's some degree. So, okay, fine. I can kind of get my head around that initially. But the, the concept of um, planning and building a business and understanding um, value proposition for different people and um, understanding pricing, so pricing is very hard. How do you price a product that doesn't exist in the market? How do you know how much someone's going to pay for that? Um, also, trying to describe a product and system that doesn't exist to investors with no other previous example of how, they, how it's been done. It's much easier to come in and say, we're like such and such food delivery company, but actually we are doing X better. Um, because you have a benchmark. So if you don't have one, you don't have a reference, it's harder sell and it's a higher risk. Um, so the role is very different. For me, the role as a CEO is very different to um, the founder of a architectural or design agency. Um, I have to be, I'm the sort of gateway between um, sort of senior management that I've brought in, advisors, non-execs, investors and then the team who work um their damn hardest to make things happen mm. so that is a very different relationship and you suddenly have to treat design or architecture which is a big part of my dna as only one component mm. of all the other roles that i have to fill yeah so it's a big shift um because you can't you, you can't run a business as a designer or an architect. You mm. have to be the CEO, which means you have to do the finances. You're looking at all the POs. You're making sure everything is filed on time. You're talking to all the legals. You're managing all the contracts. Um, you're also arranging all of the press and coordination for how your marketing strategy is going to work. Um, and then you're, of course, developing all the product as well, um, but also alongside all the software and the technology. Um, and then uh, you're trying to answer to the usual stuff which is great uh someone's copying us on the other side of the world how do we deal with this um or so and so hasn't paid us for three months why have they done that and all the firefighting that comes alongside all of that so that's a very different ball game to running an agency mm. uh, in my mind where it's a lot simpler right and so what has been the process then from taking this these cups from an idea to what stage you're at now so just um can you contextualize where you are right now with the company so we are right now we're sitting in our um at the agency of rga so there are investors uh, rga our digital communication agency that um have clients like knights and beats and dre and 
um, Unilever and um, some incredible brands that they work with and they've launched um, essentially a venture studio that looks to put money into emerging technologies that they feel will change the landscape and really sort of resonate with their current um, clients as well. So currently we, we're launching on the 1st of August with our first major customer um, who are Cushman and Wakefield. So interestingly, it's come back circle. Uh, so Cushman and Wakefield are one of the largest commercial real estate groups in the world. Right. Um, competitors with JLL, CBRE. Um, their main focus isn't just the property portfolio space, but of course the services that they provide to their portfolio spaces. So that could be anything from Cup Club to um, cleaning facilities to anything that is buildings associated. So they're our first client, but they also become a channel because then we can take um, Cup Club across their portfolio of um, buildings and that a lot of them are headquarters, so workplace is the first place for us to really kind of settle down in. We have a growing, uh, really exciting um, list of um, businesses that we're now scoping and working with. I can't say until it's live, but everything from large corporates to university campuses to certain airports to new geographical locations from North America to the Far East, um, who are all looking to eliminate single-use packaging, specifically around takeaway cups, and replace them with returnable systems like ours. So that's currently what you know what we're working through. We're a team of eight, a combination of um, design engineering, both hardware and software, um, as well as operations and supply chain, uh, communications and legal. So that's kind of our, our bulk of our team. And we're, we're actually a global team. So we're based partly in London, Kenya, France, India. Yeah. Right. Wow. So yeah. Um, it's exciting. <laughs> and and so you're in a uh, you've gone through various phases of investment. And how does that work? How does just for someone like running an architectural practice? Because this is obviously another world where it's unusual for architectural practices to find yeah. investors. But I actually think it's a really really interesting process in itself. Yeah. In particular, I've learned so much from talking to other entrepreneurs in different disciplines about the process of getting investment, yeah. why you might look for investment, um, and also, you know, the, the pitching element of it, the yeah. salesmanship element of it, but yeah. also the kind of mentorship element of getting an investor. So That's if you talk a, little, talk a little bit about that process, because I, I do think there's a lot of wisdom in that process yeah. as well that you can distill and take into your own architectural, like a more traditional architectural practice? Yeah. So I, okay, so very consciously from, from Bartlett days, in fact, I've always had, um, I've always had mentors, whether that was my tutor, whether that was someone I was working for, or in the case of Cup Club, I brought in our non-exec, um, Gavin Starks, who's um, incredibly smart, um, really talented, a bit of a fiery Scotsman, um, but also someone who helps me guide the business, but also is mentoring me to become the CEO that I need to be. Mm. Not today, but also tomorrow, and when we start raising even more funding and investment. Because you, as a uh, on a journey of a CEO path, you you are continuously becoming a better version of yourself. Mm. And you have to become a better version of yourself because the types of people that you will be bringing into the team will be more experienced as you go along. The investors that you will be bringing in will be far more um, experts and experienced as you go along. And the types of conversations, whether it's partnerships or deals that you'll be doing, will be far more complex. And so very earlier on, I realized, A, because it's this is a completely new area for me, I've you know, technology is a new area. There are lots of terminology uh, words that I don't know and that I'm learning all the time. Uh, I know where my domain expertise is, but I've been conscious to bring in the domain expertise in areas where I'm not great at to help us along the way. So operations and supply chain, technology, all of those aspects. And it's when you start building that that you build confidence in investors because mm. then they realize, 
okay, so you've identified A, which is really important. You have to identify what you're not good at and um, also identify what the company needs and how you are going to set yourself up to be better than anyone else in the market. Um, that's all they care about. They want to know you've got the right team. They want to know that you've got the right product and you're in the market uh, at the right time. So what's fortunate is the market is perfect and primed. Um, the product is completely new and innovative, competition-wise. Not that much visibility of what else is happening in the market, which is brilliant. So we're, I would say, first in line. We're also leading because we won the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's New Plastics Economy Innovation Prize. So we have the backing of an incredible organization. We get, you know, we get to speak to businesses like institutions like the UN. We get to go to Davos. We get to speak at incredible conferences like Sustainable Brands and all of the thought leadership that you need as a business um, to set yourself up for success as well as the team who are now emerging and they're coming from everywhere. So you need the press PR marketing to be able to attract the right team. That's the first important thing. They want mm -hmm. to see awards. They want to see that you're incredible. They want to see um, that, yeah, you're raising a lot of money. Um, without that, mm, your friends will be behind you, but the real people who are absolute domain experts won't be interested in what you're doing yet. So as a CEO, you're proving to the world why you're the best, but also you're trying to attract the, the right kind of talent to you as opposed to other businesses that they might be looking at. Mm. So you're trying to win the right team. It's kind of like, um, sometimes it feels a bit like herding cats. Like you're sort of, <laughs> you're trying to like, okay, I've got this now. Oh no, there's another one on loose. Okay. Um, and investors are very, I would say, they can get on board. Once you've convinced investors, they're very supportive. But the journey up to that can take up to six months, minimum. So if you're having conversations... Actually, actually getting somebody to put getting money in. Getting money in your account, quite often. Depends how big they are and how complex they are and whether you push them fast enough, great. Takes anywhere between two to six months, typically, for a large institutional investor to be able to put money in your company. So it's not, it's not a quick process. Yeah. Alongside that, what you have to do is um, you have to show them in that six months when you started and then right up to the point where they do put money in um, how you've improved. Because all they're looking to do is find a way out. <laughs> that's just, that's literally just, it's just how, it's, it's hilarious. They're just looking for a reason to not invest in you. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's a high risk and you have to de-risk it in every single possible way. And it's a bit of an art. You sort of, you talk through the basics. You talk through, right, this is what we've achieved. This is our team. This is our ambition. These are our sales. Great, they understand that. But then you have to also de-risk it in the sense that you have to, you have to explain to them how you have personally thought through every single possible eventuality and how you will determine how you're going to get over that. And you have to answer those questions very well. So that has to come through training. This is, this is why it's really fascinating, because that is such good business disciplines to be developing. Yeah. And that I think any business that you're running, if you're able to kind of think about it in terms of like, well, what if I was, what if I did have an investor? I've got to be able to show the measurables, metrics. Yes, KPIs. What, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they, they, so what's interesting is every investor will have their own set of, um, priorities and questions so some impact investors are great because they're actually looking for your impact metrics as well so what's what is an impact investor so impact investors are putting money in but they want to see um, not just return commercial but return in um, whether that's environmental impact or social impact so they want to understand how your product is benefiting the greater good um, whether that is job creating so that's a social impact or whether it's um, um, saving X amount of uh, plastics packaging from from becoming you know, from going to landfill, or it's reducing the amount of CO two produced, or it could be a number of things that they want to track. So they will it will depend on what kind of investors, and you have to find your niche. So this is another learning. Um, there are many investors out there who are looking to put their money in different things, and you have to very quickly identify the ones that you think already 90% you're going in with 
with a good feel that this mm. is the sort of person who will be interested in your business versus some other software company out there. So how do you determine what's a good investor for you? Um, what do you look for an investor? Because obviously um, uh, it, it can't just be about the money. I'm sure that's a major, a major aspect of it, but there are also lots of other qualities that it's, an investor will bring or lots of different forms of investment. Yes. So it's a bit like making friends, right? <laughs> you know, there are lots of things that go into your mind about, hmm, is he good company? Has he got something interesting to say? Is he going to be there for me when, you know, times are bad? Um, can I go to him for advice? Um, can I ask him for some money? Um, and then pay him back later? Or is he going to like never pick up my calls? Mm. Um, is he just going to be on holiday all the time? Um, when really awful things happen, uh, will he disappear? Um, it's, it's literally like finding the right friends because you'll be spending about five to 10 years working with those people. Your wow. investors are your family. So it's, it's, it's in many cases a longer kind of relationship than many architectural projects. Yes. Yeah, with investors, they're looking. I mean, you you could of course become an incredibly high valued company and and reach for the skies and get acquired within three to five years if that's what if that's the company that you're building. But if it's kind of a new product in a new market, um, addressing a very big problem, it'll probably take about five to ten years for them to get their ROIs, to get their money back, to get um, to see the upside of their investment. Mm. And they're going to be, you know, wanting updates from you every quarter, at least. Um, we send out uh, an investor newsletter out every six weeks to say, hi, guys, this is what we've been up to. We've, these are the new recruits. Um, this is how many sales we've done. Um, this is who's talking about us. So we cover the main areas, you know, sales, marketing, product, uh, team. And... Uh, you want to be able to include them into some of your meetings when you're looking at building new projections. You're going to call them in uh, at certain times when their skills and expertise will be great. But then also you'll be, you'll be calling them to say, things have not gone so well, we really need your help on X. Or we actually haven't raised enough, we need to open another round, you need to put in double the amount of money that we thought you were going to put in. Can you do that for us? So <laughs> serious conversations. <laughs> <laughs> so you know they 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 your and and they're gunning for you, they're batting for you, and it's all. Um, I've I've learned this over the last couple of months in particular because that's primarily a big part of what I'm doing currently is raising. Um, but it is all about whether they like you as a founder and as CEO, and they believe in you. That is the first most important thing because. Ultimately, you are driving everything. So if they believe in you, that's one tick. Mm. Then they'll want to believe in your uh, team. That's another tick. Then they'll want to believe that you combined all of that will succeed. That's another tick. And so then they've invested and they kind of, then they're in. So, and yeah. so And so will an investor, so some of the investors you're working with, do they have numerous investments? They're working with numerous sort of startup companies or companies at your level Lots. Lots. Yeah, lots. And so if they've had previous experience in investing, then they'll be able, be able to bring those key learned mistakes or successes from, from elsewhere. Um, and it is literally like making friends because you know very quickly if someone is going to... Uh, what's the word? Um, so some people you will naturally... Um, be more inclined towards because they will engage you more. They will, you know, they will challenge you on certain things more. They will instantly make you more curious mm. or they will have information that you have no exposure to and so you're just, you're just completely enamored by them. Investors are the same. Uh, some will come to you and you'll feel very, like, uh, <laughs> underwhelmed. <laughs> you'll mm. think, okay, everything that you've said in the last 10 minutes is actually really obvious stuff and I really can't see what value you'll bring to me or my company. Mm. Obviously, you're having this conversation in your mind. Um, you're not saying it to them <laughs> personally. Um, and also, you're thinking, oh, you'll be really annoying to have constant meetings with and I really can't see that happening. Yeah. And you have to have these conversations very honestly with yourself Yeah. because you owe it to them if you're taking their money 
to keep them up to date and to be engaged with them and treat them all fairly. And so if you can't see a relationship beyond that, you should just very politely decline. So so just to, just to be clear then, this, this role of the investor, because you know, from a traditional architectural company, you're able to generate cash yep. from selling services. Yep. But in a project like this where, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot just to even get yes. one of these cups yeah. made yeah. and you're not selling anything yet. So essentially the investor is the one that's kind of paying everything. Risk. And, and, how, and how long does that kind of take? The, what, what process, what part of, what do you mean? Well, before you're able to, well, you said that the investor better kind of start seeing returns in about 10 years possibly. Five to ten years. Five, five to ten years. Yeah, it's a long game, and they will. It's, it's a sort of you know you buy stocks and shares. You might see upsides of um, more frequently. So let's say you buy Spotify today, and you sit on it for about a couple of months. You could probably see a return and sell them back. Mm. With startups, because we're building companies and it's an uncertain market, it's not a regular business like an agency or an architecture practice. There are no unknowns. Everyone knows that you're providing services for architecture. Mm. And it could be uh, interiors, it could be the whole project, it could be master planning. It's, it's a very kind of easily landscaped business where you've got a product that's entering into a new market, new price points, new technology, new user behavior, um, there is a level of uncertainty around all of that. And so, yes, uh, our investors, when they first came in, we were pre-revenue, so we hadn't closed our major contract with Cushman. And we had figured out the price points, but uh, we needed the investment to actually make our small production run. So as a hardware startup uh, in packaging, we're building, we're designing all of this in-house with our engineers and designers. Um, and we had to physically invest in tooling, injection molding, so we could get the product and show it to people. There's only so much you can do when you've 3D printed stuff. You can't put <laughs> coffee in a 3D printed cup and give it to a brand and say, would you sign this off? They'd sort of look at you thinking, that's not happening. So um, there's a lot of upfront investment that we needed to just, just start the process. Um, so before RGA came in, I had, uh, we'd won the prize, which was a cash prize as well. So besides the press and PR, we got, uh, we got funds through to help us get this up and running. Um, before that, how did we invest ourselves? So we did proof of concepts and we just bought different products and tested them out using a friends and family round. And to be honest, I was just running on uh, a very small budget on a monthly basis mm -hmm. and just keeping everything down to minimum. So you have a, you know, there's a, the, when I started this as a sketch in 2015 to where we are now, there was maybe about at least seven, eight months when it was really awful. Mm -hmm. Like there was no plain light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there was no money in the bank. There was no product that was out in people's hands. It was just an idea forever. And you're just battling and pushing and pushing, and you're thinking, no, this has to happen somehow. It's so obvious. It's definitely a solution. Um, and then, then things start to fall together. Mm. So, yeah, it's not easy. It's, really, it's actually really hard. It's much easier when you've gone through the worst time and you've come out the other side. Mm. To, to think, oh, great, this is now feeling, um, it's feeling like a business. It's, um, we've made our first sales and we've got a fantastic new team coming together and we've got investment. And now it feels like, okay, now we're, now we're growing. Now we've got, now I can see the future actually <laughs> panning out. It doesn't look like a graveyard. Um, so, you know, you come out, but it, it was genuinely a really awful journey to get there. It's really testing and trying process. So, what, what's been the biggest obstacles that you've overcome, and how did you overcome them? Hmm. I think you uh, yourself is a, one of the biggest obstacles. Mm. So, um, imposter syndrome is a real problem. Mm. I think it's a bigger problem in female female founders and female leaders because they just um, they are their own enemy. So you sort of question your own validity. You think you're a fraud for a long time. And I did so as well because I thought, and to even some degree, but I, 
I don't ever get arrogant and say, yes, I'm, uh, I'm a fantastic CEO. Oh my God, look at me. But, um, you know, there's always things to learn. You really are not the expert ever in my mind. I don't think you can ever be. But yes, you are the expert at what you do and you're probably better than everyone else, but you're, you're, you've still got a lot to learn. Mm. Um, but giving yourself that credibility um, and as an architect, it was really tough because this was not my domain. Packaging is not my expert area. Plastic certainly isn't. Um, injection molding and manufacturing, definitely not. Um, and so for a long time, I just thought, what are you doing? This is not your area. Like, uh, <laughs> this, this is bizarre. This is insane. You know, go and find experts who can, who can tackle this. And I just thought one day I just, uh, I just had to sit myself down and get over that process. Mm. And there are a, lo a lot of other, there were some really great, um, uh, pieces written by Tina Fey and a bunch of other famous people who, have cited this problem and they've come up with great exercises that you can do to get over the imposter syndrome. So I did all of those. What was your favorite exercise that you did? Uh, you okay, so you have to answer a bunch of questions, but you have to handwrite it on a piece of paper and you've got to just, just let every thought that's in your mind just mm. flow onto the piece of paper. And it's a quite a emotional cathartic process. Yeah. And when you're finished with it, you're meant to crumple up that piece of paper when you're ready and throw it away. And um, it was it was great. It was I mean I had to do it in, obviously in solitary. You do it on your own. You're not kind mm. of doing it in the middle of a party and sharing it with friends <laughs> because it's it's your own personal journey. So having gone through that, um, so that was one blocker. I think I think the other blocker is um, is never yeah. So a lot of the blockers I haven't I would never blame them on externalities. I would yeah. blame them always on yourself. Mm. Um, although some people will disagree, but I I genuinely think that if you put your mind to, to something, um, you will make it happen if you genuinely just keep pushing. So quite often it's it's not a blocker. It's just that. You're As a CEO, you are always pushing. You're, you're always taking like sole responsibility for everything. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm surrounded by a really great team, so I don't feel isolated anymore as such. Um, but there was obviously, before I built the team, there was this sort of slight fear, obviously, mm. um, that I'm wasting my time. Mm. Or um, what if this is not it? Or... Um, you know, I'm spending all my time in this and maybe I should be spending my time somewhere else or lots of things. So I'm sure you have conversations with family and friends and exactly. And oh, kind of Safia, um, you know, you're not an architect anymore. And oh, so you're not doing architecture anymore. And you're just, you're sort of battling. Um, so there was a moment where I had to, uh, rationalize all of this in the context of me as an architect, mm -hmm. um, because they were kind of moving separately for some time and I had to mentally bring them back together so I could make peace with who I am and what I'm doing and mm. why I'm doing it so that when that happened I thought right great that's a great reference because there's no one out there who is an architect who is looking at this the way I'm going to be looking at this and that puts us in a really amazing position so yeah Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's so nice to hear. It's really inspiring to hear that kind of frankness about the, you know, the internal, you know, we become our biggest obstacle. Journey, yeah. And it's something that's often not spoken about in business a lot. But yeah. I know when I, when I do speak with, you know, very successful people, they will always reflect you know we you know what the biggest obstacle is actually me yeah and my ways of thinking and the way that I was relating to myself and what I thought was possible um and it's you know and it's kind of something something that every single person can relate to because we've all got these kind of doubts or yeah we don't fear. know what, with the fear we don't know yeah. you know is this the right thing are we doing this you know family members might be you know when their best you know interests intentions are, yeah yeah ask you questions that are kind of like oh. <laughs> well I think I it's in human nature to um it's in human nature to resist change um to many to a, to a very large degree so most people will not be entrepreneurs because 
um, it's it, it's just a. I mean, you're asking for a lot <laughs> from a person. You're asking them to put everything at stake, um, to put everything that they know that they're comfortable with aside and chase something which is a complete question mark. Um, and that will put them through a roller coaster of emotions and might come out on the other side successful mm. or not. And so your family is kind of thinking, um, are you sure this is the right move? And those are valid questions, I think, because if you, you know, in some degree, um, you need that because if you also as, a, as an entrepreneur and CEO did not go through this process, you wouldn't come out the other side. Yeah. You wouldn't have gone through that training. It's, it's, a, it's a rite of passage as well, as awful as it is. If you do make it on the other side, great, because then the chances are you will make this succeed because A, you've invested so much time and you can't turn around at this stage because that would be awful. Um, <laughs> but also you've proven so many, you've gone through so many personal checks and bound, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh, timelines to demonstrate why this is important to you and why you should be doing this um, and laying your ground in that. So um, I think in, in many ways, architects are kind of quite, um, I mean, they're some of the most intelligent and skilled people in the world. I genuinely think we are an incredibly highly skilled community of people. Yes highly skilled some of the most smartest people and what i didn't know we're also catnip to the tech community they love architects <laughs> they love architects it's amazing i had no idea until you know i joined um you know until rga invested and some of the uh, the md was saying oh my god you've no idea oh my god yeah technologists love architects it's because of your systems thinking mm. you can really look at how you bring lots of different things together um, and I thought, yeah, oh my God, of course. So why, why would we silo ourselves into a very kind of linear, uh, narrow field of an industry, which actually has so much wide application today in the digital, in the digital world yeah. is, is like beyond me. Why, why would you do that? So I think we're seeing it more with the millennial culture, a lot of shift and change. Um, in how they want to approach architecture, what they want to be doing, um, and mixing things up. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. How could um, you? How would, how do you think schools could start to address this? Because I'm I'm very much in the same sort of thinking that there's so much unlocked potential there with the of what, education. Yeah, with what architects can do and the different fields that we can go into. It's almost. And yeah. I've, said, I've said this before. Like sometimes. Many architects who go for that, that training school could be a very kind of experimental phase. Yeah. And then sometimes it's not always the right thing, but, you know, because there's a professional qualification at the end yeah. of it and you're on this very structured process, yeah. it seems like the right thing to do to go and get qualified and then end up working in an architectural yeah. practice. Yeah. But actually, there is so many different applications or, you know, the way of thinking about organizing space can be translated to so many different industries. Yeah. And a little bit of entrepreneurial flair can start to really... Yeah. I would, I mean, I think because it is a professional industry still mm. and a lot of what, um, so what's interesting is I'm trying to bring in a lot of the uh, aspect of the the service industry and architecture into the quality and standards of our service, so our packaging as a service, um, which is really hard, by the way. It's very hard to bring what you see in terms of quality and skill in a professional industry such as our, with architects into uh, anything outside professional services. So, you know, what um, our supply chain, our washing logistics partners and how, how they behave when they deliver products. And it's a difference between how John Lewis um, interacts with you compared to maybe Alibaba or other services. So what is very good and transferable as well is the entire rigor of teaching and qualifying you as an architect and mm. how you apply that into the other industries or aspects that you might want to look at. So I actually like the, um, the training and the rigor of understanding A, how to design really well, 
then uh, all the legal aspect of understanding how to deploy and deliver projects and qualify and pr become a professional in that c category mm. and then move into understanding how you can then apply that to other products and services in other fields. I quite like that journey. I wouldn't take away um, the education path mm. currently as it is. I think it's a very well... Um, it's a very well structured, and there's enough variety in there. You can go to lots of different schools and get whatever it is that you're looking for. So you can find that really easily, and then after qualifying, you can decide what you want to do. I think there needs to be more organizations and more visibility of architects who have gone on to do different things, mm -hmm. being brought back into institutions like the RIBA, the ARB, um, the AJ, BD, talking about all of the other diverse portfolio of architects that are going out and doing different things in society. I think that visibility will really drive um, what the new generation will see as their role as an architect. Because my role as an architect is very different to someone practicing at an agency right now. Yeah. My role as an architect is educating people in the plastics packaging space. It's about educating people uh, in the waste industry. It's about educating people in the real estate agents, uh, industry. Uh, it's about educating brands. And it's a really different uh, conversation to my conversations with planners or structural engineers or um, the usuals. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Safia. I could, I could talk to you for ages. That was absolutely brilliant. So awesome. thank Thanks. you so much. It was really uh, fun. I look forward to doing the next one. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.